Welcome everybody to the Stronger Marriage webinar. Our special guest today is Dr. Brad Simpson. Um, Dr. Simpson earned his bachelor's degree at BYU-Idaho and followed his passion for social work by pursuing his master's degree from the University of Utah and his doctoral degree in social work from the University of Tennessee. Um, Brad specializes in working with couples, families, and adolescents in acute inpatient, intensive outpatient, and residential settings. He's intensively trained in dialect dialectical behavior therapy and provides training for mental health professionals across the United States. He's currently an associate professor and director of the Bachelors of Social Work program at Southern Utah University, the director of research and development at Sunrise Res Residential Treatment Center, and the founder and owner of Third Wave Counseling and Consulting. Today, Dr. Simpson Simpson's presentation for us will be called, is titled, um, The Mindful Marriage and Experiential Approach. Um, Dr. Simpson will be teaching us about the benefits of mindfulness for your, for your marriage and relationships. This will be an experiential opportunity for you to practice using mindfulness in a practical way and helping you attend to the people who matter most in your lives and strengthen your marriage. Um, there will be an anonymous, well, there'll be a Q&A session with Dr. Simpson for the final 15 minutes um, with the option to ask question, questions anonymously. Um, feel free to write down your questions as they come up so you can remember them later when the Q&A session comes up. Um, this webinar is also approved for one continuing education credit. Um, and the, the chat feature is disabled, but my chat line will be open in the case that you have technical difficulties. Um, Dr. Simpson, thank you so much for, for presenting today. We're really excited to hear from you and the time is yours. Awesome, thanks Camilla for, anyways, for letting me be on and thanks everybody for jumping on with us. It's good to be with you. I've heard the previous ones of these have been fantastic and, and uh, hopefully if you've attended any of those today, can hold to what's already been done in the past. So um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know about you, but I, um, I tend to try to multitask and do as much as I possibly can. And that, that feeling or that tendency to do as much as I can tends to extend uh, to all of my relationships. And, and I, I would love to say that it didn't impact my marriage, but it absolutely does. And so I hope today as you're joining us that you're ready to learn more about mindfulness and having a mindful marriage. And today will be a little bit of a different approach. We'll obviously learn some psycho ed things and, and things you need to learn that way. But we're also going to learn and use some practice examples so that you really get an opportunity to practice mindfulness together while you're with us. And that's kind of the other intent that we want to be sure and accomplish today together. So um, you read, read my bio and Camilla did a great job going through that. So we really want to learn mindfulness, the benefits of mindfulness to individuals and couples. Uh, we want to learn the skills or how to practice mindfulness. So some of the skills that we'll, we'll practice together are going to be um, self-compassion, um, some loving kindness meditation that are partner focused so that we're working uh, with our spouse and strengthening our marriage. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about kind of the daily practice of mindfulness and then give you some examples and practical applications that you can uh, hopefully use in regards to mindfulness with your partner. So um, be aware of that and, and just know that's really the intent today. So if, if you have moments where we're silent, just know that there were probably some instructions that were associated with that in regards to us practicing mindfulness together. So, um, you know, you can sit in a lot of these and hear that you need to do mindfulness, but uh, often we don't practice together, which is going to be a, a critical part today. So um, well, I'm curious, and obviously you're not going to be able to put in the chat, but but in your own mind, think about this. How many of you have ever driven home without remembering how you got there? Has anybody ever experienced that before? Um, my commute's grown a little bit. I, I, uh, I drive about 40 minutes and, and um, for my commute, sometimes it's 20, depending on where I'm headed or where I'm going. Um, and, and I have driven home almost the whole way without remembering how I got there. 
And, and you think about how many things we do in our lives when they're automatic or routine, often those automatic or routine things that we don't think about, that we don't give attention to, um, and that we don't pay attention to. So, um, you know, some of the really common ones, right, are doing dishes. When you're doing the dishes, how often do you really think about doing dishes? When you're walking, how often do you think about walking? And I'm not saying that you have to do that all the time. However, there's this level and this balance, right? That's really important. So we're going to talk about some of that. And I, I hope to increase your attention and awareness, not just of driving home, but then you think about things within marriage. So if driving home becomes routine and I often don't attend to it or pay attention to it and I get home without ever thinking, maybe some of you think I'm crazy by saying that. Think about things within your marriage relationship or within somebody that matters to you most, uh, think about things in those relationships that have become routine that you don't, you could be doing, but you don't attend to. And that could be the needs of your partner. That could be, uh, you know, it could be lots of things, but give that some thought. What are the things in my marriage that have become routine? Like my drive home that I've been involved with or, or uh, you know, Maybe when I get home, right? That's a very routine thing. And and uh, I just get home and kind of do my thing, right? And I don't attend to my partner. So think about those things that have become routine that you may do, but you don't attend to. And, and we'll talk more about that. I just want to make a quick case for this thought around marriage. I think it's, um, you've maybe heard of some of these. This was a study done in 2005, 2006. Linda Wade at the University of Chicago, she's a researcher, discovered that 80% of people who rated their marriages as unhappy in a national survey when, when asked five years later, they ranked it happier, which I think is interesting. So here they said they're unhappy. Five years later, they rated as uh, happier. Of the couples that rated their marriage as miserable, that was 2%, so a very low category. But of the couples that rated their marriage uh, miserable, um, 77% in five years rated their marriage as very happy. And so think about that. Are there things that you're doing? Or are you in a position right now where you, you want to improve your marriage or maybe you're less than satisfied with it? And of course, there's always room for improvement in our relationships as there is in our own growth and, and uh, journey. But th that's something to really think about. So the researchers found that on average, unhappily married adults who divorced were no happier than their counterparts who remained married. And I think that's something we've got to consider when rated on any of the 12 separate measures of psychological well-being, well divorce did not typically reduce symptoms of depression, raise self-esteem, or increase uh, a sense of mastery. And so when you think about that, and you think about um, there might be sometimes our tendency is to look outside our marriage or look outside ourselves or to external factors to somehow make things better or make us better. But at the end of the day, if I'm driving home and it's routine and I'm not thinking about it, there may be some things that I need to really consider and look at there. And, and it doesn't mean there aren't causes for divorce or times where that's very appropriate, and there absolutely are. However, I think sometimes we may, we may attend to that or look externally before we look internally or within our relationships and seek improvement in that way. So the things they did, here's what was interesting. They found those couples that were together that five years later rated their marriage better. They broke it down into three perspectives or what they called ethics or three categories. And I think these are interesting, but they, they interviewed these couples to find out well, what, what was it? Why did you rate it happier after five years? Here's what they found. The one was the, they called it the mar marital endurance ethic. And this was couples said marriages got happier, not because partners resolved problems, but because they stubbornly outlasted them. Uh, with the passage of time, these spouses said that many sources of conflict and distress eased financial problems, job reversals, depression, child problems, even infidelity. So I, I think that's very interesting that what they called the marital endurance. The other category was the marital work ethic. Uh, couples reported changed behavior and improved communication um, because they worked at it, right? But when the problem was solved, the marriage got happier. Strategies from improving marriages mentioned by spouses range from arranging dates or other ways to more time together that they spent. Enlisting the help and advice of relatives or in-laws, consulting clergy or counselors, 
um, even threatening to divorce and consulting divorce attorneys help them engage in this idea of work ethic. And so I, I think that's really interesting. That's the one that I would uh, propose to you today, right? That I'm going to help you increase your work ethic. And then the other one that we'll talk about is the personal happiness ethic. That one's really important. And that's the one we're going to work on as well today. And I hope this will contribute to for you. But the personal happiness ethic is what it sounds like. Essentially, you know, the marriage problems didn't seem to change that much. But instead, married people in those accounts told stories of finding alternative ways to improve their own happiness and build a good, happy life despite maybe a mediocre marriage. Now, that doesn't mean I leave my partner behind, but it does mean this idea that I'm going to choose if I, I'm happy or not, and I'm going to do some things to help me get there. And so I would I would uh, posture to you or just position to you that today that this idea of the mindful marriage is really what's going to help you in those two categories. When you look at that marital work ethic, it will. When you look at the personal happiness ethic, it will. It also may help you in regards to this acceptance of a marital endurance, that that could even be healthy or okay. And, and so sometimes you'll see that in our, our attitudes and our marriages and our relationships, there's this idea that we can be very change focused. And I, I'm also saying that there are times and moments that we also need to be acceptance focused. And I think that's more the marital endurance ethic is that acceptance based principle, where the marital work ethic and personal happiness, there can be some acceptance and change, but they tend to be a little more change focused. So the other concept or idea that I quickly want to go over is this idea that our willingness versus our willfulness in the marriage and in our relationships. Um, they found that couples often neglect the things that brought them together, which is why they say they're dissatisfied. Markham, Stanley, and Bloomberg mention activities such as uh, exercising, swimming, hiking, doing yoga, playing tag, cooking, collecting she seashells, watching movies, having soda, talking, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on and on. Mindfulness, may I say that? I, you'll say that after today. But these activities themselves are not as important as the attitude that we have when we're doing them. So it's this idea that I'm going to be willing to engage in these new experiences and, and these activities with my spouse. And that doesn't mean I like them all the time. Um, you can pick some activities that you know your spouse really enjoys that you may not like. Uh, I know one in our family is football. Um, I love football. My wife doesn't necessarily like football. However, um, she's done a little more of that with me, right? And there's some things she does that I just really don't enjoy. She loves to go shopping and walk down the aisles together. And that drives me crazy. So I can't say I'm perfect at it. But I can say some of these things that maybe have become routine I could be more willing in engaging in those, those activities uh, with her and together. And that's kind of the critical part. So I hope to help you cultivate as we look at this mindful marriage that I'm, I'm also, I'm starting to engage and remember the things that have come become routine or automatic. I start to become more aware of those within my marriage. And then the other thing is that I have a willingness uh, versus a willfulness. We talk about willingness is open hands, willfulness is closed hands, right? But that I have a willingness to engage in activities together, uh, despite maybe I, they're super enjoyable or not, right? Just like one of, the one of the things I have learned that I really don't like is household tasks. My, my wife will write me a list and, and often there's nothing more that I can do with her is just engage in that and be willing in that. And uh, some of the things she likes, just projects, big projects that she enjoys. And she loves working on those. Sometimes we'll do them together. Sometimes they're separate. But the reality is we work on them. And my willingness to do that makes a big difference in our marriage. So, again, we're, we want you to be mindful in that you're going to engage in activities that have come routine or uh, automatic that you've been less mindful of within your marriage. And then I also want you to cultivate this idea of willingness in activities, to engage in activities, to engage in those things that maybe you've been more willful to engage in. So I'll, I'll let you think about this. If anybody can guess where this is, I'll be amazed. Um, this is one of my favorite places. When I think of mindfulness or being able to attend in the moment or be present in the moment, this is the place I often think about. This is, uh, believe it or not, this isn't Hawaii. This is in the middle of the Grand Canyon, um, 
And uh, this is, it's not in Grand Canyon National Park, it's right next to it. It's on the Havasupai uh, Indian Reservation. And some of you may have been there, um, but it looks just like that picture. It, it's incredible. You get down there, it's 10 miles down into the middle of the Grand Canyon. It's right along the Colorado River. This is what's feeding this. 10 miles down in the canyon, you can either take mule, you can hike or helicopter. There's no other way there. You, it takes effort, right? It takes a lot of work to get there, but you get down there and it's this incredible place. There's six or seven waterfalls that you can go to. Havasupai stands for the people of the blue green water. And the people of the blue green water, it makes sense they call they they call themselves this simply because you get down there and the and the water is this really beautiful blue green. And that's a time where I find myself being able to attend to the moment and be present in the moment and be mindful. And it's remarkable. And think about in your own marriage, that first time, you know, you think about some of those first things you did together. It could be your first date, could be a first kiss. It could be uh, the first time you served or helped one another or felt validated by one another. Think of some of those firsts in your marriage and how uh, um, inspiring, how exciting, how awe-inspiring awe those might have been. And, and maybe how some of those activities I just lift, listed over time have become routine. And the problem is, is maybe that I could work on or the thing I can work on is how do I attend to this this in a different way. Well, the thing I love about Havasupai, again, it takes effort. It's 10 miles down. Then you're in this amazing place. You can play in these blue-green waters. You can swim, all that kind of stuff. And then it's also 10 miles out, and there's no way out but up. Um, yeah, you could get helicopter out, but it's not always consistent, so you really are better just hiking out. And it's a lot of work, and it takes a lot of effort. And I think about mindfulness is very much that way. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of effort. And it also applies to our marriage. Being mindful of our marriage takes a lot of practice and a lot of effort. And yet the rewards are just what we saw earlier, that if we build in some of those ethics that we talked about, that work ethic, that personal happiness ethic, maybe even the endurance ethic, that will allow us to then years later, maybe it's years later, maybe it's moments later. I don't, I don't know what it will be for you, but you may have some increased satisfaction. And, I, and I'll talk about that. There's a lot of benefits to mindfulness. So when we talk about mindfulness, there's this concept or this idea that we have two states of mind. And, and you may feel this as couples, that, that one leans towards one state of mind or the other, uh, but you have these two states of mind, right? And on the one hand, you have this emotional mind, and on the other hand, you have what's called reasonable mind. And have you ever known somebody that's so reasonable, they forget to pay attention to what they feel? Or have you ever known somebody that's so emotional, they forget to pay attention to logic or reason? And hopefully you're not looking at your spouse as you think about it. And sometimes there can be polarizing that way that our spouses, our brains just work different. The other way I've heard this articulated is that we have on our reasonable mind is what's called our doing mind. And our emotion mind is what's called our being mind. And so, you know, people that may be more doing focused or being focused, I think that plays out in my own relationship with my spouse. She tends to be better at being, uh, and that comes a little more naturally to her. I tend to be more focused on doing. And uh, so sometimes she's like, hey, can we just stay home and sit and not do anything? And I'm always like, well, what can we do next? Where are we going to go, Right. And, and it takes a lot for me to bring myself down to be able to do that. And for her, sometimes she's like, okay, we're going. I'm just going to push and we're going to push through, right? But regardless, we know this occurs within ourselves as well. And, and the synthesis or the balance between those two states of mind is what we call our wise mind. And so we practice mindfulness so that we can make wise-minded decisions. We can make wise-minded choices. And so we can be present with the moment. Um, you can think of, maybe think of some examples. I, I, have, uh, I have a wife and six children, and uh, so I tend to watch a lot of kid movies. Um, so you're going to hear movie references as we're talking. But uh, when you think about from movies, who do you think about in this reasonable mind that they're so reasonable they forget to pay attention to emotion or this emotional mind? There's some really common ones. If you've ever seen Star Trek, uh, Spock, is very much that character that's that reasonable, logical mind. In fact, that's really the whole dilemma he faces throughout all the seasons and all the series. There's 
I don't know how many hundreds, somebody probably knows. Um, but of all those episodes, Spock is a really good example of uh, that logical mind. And he's trying to figure out in all those episodes, this human experience and what emotion is like and what it drives people to do. And he wants that. And so you see him kind of reach for that emotional mind. Well, the other people have compared maybe Captain Kirk to emotion mind, right? That he, he acts on his gut. He acts on that moment. He doesn't necessarily always take logic into, into play that it needs to. Uh, the other one that's a really common one is Big Bang Theory. If you've seen Big Bang Theory, Penny. Uh, Penny is a really good example of that reasonable mind or that logic. I'm mean, not Penny. Uh, Sheldon is that really good example of uh, reasonable or logical mind. And then other people have used, well, well, Penny is kind of that emotional mind. And you watch that play out throughout the whole seasons too. There's many of those as well. And so you can kind of get some examples of seeing how that might play out, may play out in your own mind. And it certainly does. And so we work on, if I'm in logical mind, I need to pay attention to what I'm feeling, which then allows me to be present and to make wise-minded decisions or to find that synthesis between the two. So we're going to talk about DBT, the skill mindfulness, and, and we will get to some practice here pretty quick. But just so you understand, if I were to draw a, a large circle, uh, you know, people often ask, well, what's, what is mindfulness? And then what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation? And so mindfulness really is just the quality of awareness that a person brings to an activity. So it's really a being, being effective, controlling attention, taking a non-judgmental stance. But it's just the idea, if I'm present, I'm present in the very moment that I'm in. And, and we use those funny examples, like if I'm washing the dishes, I'm washing the dishes. If I'm walking, I'm walking. But it's that quality of awareness to the very moment that I'm in. And so we use that, right? So the, what's the difference between meditation and mindfulness? Well, if I drew a big circle, that would be mindfulness, right? It kind of this is a company, this encompassing awareness of the very moment you're in. The inner circle would be meditation, which is much more a, a Zen or maybe even a religious practice that you're trying to achieve some kind of enlightenment. Well, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm simply asking you to be mindful and be more present and aware in this very moment that you're in. So if I'm with my spouse, I'm with my spouse and I'm present with them. I'm engaged with them. I put my phone down, right? I have to do that on a regular basis, whatever that might be. But I, it's this idea that I'm working on letting it go versus pu pushing it away um, and then increasing self-awareness. So I, we're going to watch a quick video that kind of walks through mindfulness and mindfulness practice. We call this in mindfulness, we call this the, the what skills and the how skills. So what we do to get into mindfulness, we use these, these principles. And then the how skills are how we do mindfulness when we're there. And so, um, you know, so people often think this really formal practice, I ring a bell, I sit on the floor, I sit cross leg, I, and, and uh, I close my eyes or I keep them open and stare at one thing. Well, that is one way of doing mindfulness. However, there's much more informal ways, which is I'm just simply being present in this very moment. And both are going to be applicable and critical to a mindful marriage. So we'll watch this video, then we'll talk about it. Do you ever find yourself in a situation that makes you want to lash out and act impulsively? Black and white thinking can cause you to act without fully considering the situation. This can disrupt your inner peace and damage your relationships. The DBT skill of mindfulness is one solution to extreme black and white thinking. Mindfulness helps you slow down, take a step back, and clearly evaluate the situation. It lets you become aware of yourself and your surroundings. There are two skills to guide you through your mindfulness practice, the what skills and the how skills. The what skills teach you how to enter a state of mindfulness. First, observe your surroundings and the feelings in your body. Next, describe what you've observed by putting it into words and only state the facts. 
Finally, mentally participate and engage fully in the present moment. Try not to let past or future thinking get in your way. The how skills teach you how to act while in a state of mindfulness. First, avoid judgment. Simply notice without assigning good or bad labels. Next, focus on one thing at a time. Try not to let external distractions get in your way. Finally, do what works for you. You might feel more effective when you're in a comfortable chair or while taking a walk. There's no exact way to practice mindfulness. Practicing the what and how skills of mindfulness are one way to get into your ideal state of mind known as wise mind. In wise mind, you are in tune with your emotions and the information they give you, as well as the logical facts of the situation you're in. By combining the aspects of emotions and reason, you can avoid impulsive behaviors and make healthy decisions. By practicing mindfulness, you're able to clearly recognize if you're being overly emotional or overly rational. Once you have reached a balance of the two and you are in wise mind, your decisions will align with your long-term goals. You'll be able to reduce your stress and anxiety, be in the present moment, and have more control over your behaviors. So does anybody wonder what she wrote? Was it more effective? I hope if she was using that skill of mindfulness, right? So that's a really good example or demonstration of, uh, again, that skill of mindfulness. And, uh, and so we talk about in that video, the what skills, what we do to get into a state of mindfulness, which is we observe, um, you know, we have what we call this Teflon mind. So it's this idea that um, if you've had a Teflon pan, it's a nonstick pan. So we have a nonstick mind. Um, thoughts will come and go. I'd look at them as a, a ship in the, in the sea, a cloud in the sky. They come and they go. And then describe is, is this idea that I, I'm descriptive of whatever is occurring. I don't place judgment on it, but I use descriptive words. A thought is a thought. A feeling is a feeling, right? I don't have to do anything with that or act on it. It just is what it is. And then participate. So I throw myself into the whatever the mindfulness is. If I'm walking, I'm walking, right? If I'm doing dishes, I'm doing dishes. It's doing what's needed in that moment. So those are what we call the what skills, what we do to get into mindfulness. And then the how skills are how we do mindfulness when we're there. So it's this idea that I take a non-judgmental stance or I'm less judgmental about the experience I'm in or the moment I'm in. Um, I focus on the what of the experience versus not the good or the bad. Um, so again, I try to take a non judgmental stance. Now that I, that fact that I'm eating this apple and all of a sudden it tastes really gross, right? I just say that I'm eating this apple. It's green. Uh, I can feel the crunch in my mouth. That, that would be the way we'd approach it if I'm trying to be present in that moment rather than adding my judgment of the past or the future to it. And then again, one mindfully, we've talked about that. I just one mindfully in this very moment, if I'm walking, I'm walking, if I'm driving, I'm driving. Um, and then effectively, which is this idea that I focus on what works, stay away from the fair, the unfair, the right or the wrong, but I'm going to do what's effective in this very moment because it works and it, it's what's most effective for this time. So keeping those in mind, if you're familiar with John Gottman, John Gottman um, wrote the book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Uh, he's also just one of the leading researchers in terms of marriage. He's able to 90% of the time predict if a couple is going to get divorced or not within the first 15 minutes, just by tracking or marking certain behaviors that they exhibit. Well, he talked about those behaviors. He listed them as toxic. They're behaviors that we all at some level engage in. Um, but then he also created in his book, if you haven't read it, one of the, the premier self-help books in regards to uh, marriage and making it work. But then he, in his book, he articulates if you engage in those toxic behaviors, those behaviors that 
predict divorce. Here's how you overcome these behaviors and here's how you do it. And he created kind of this idea of a stages or a house that's a guide for us. So we work on first that trust and commitment on both sides of the walls that hold that house up. And then the other part is that we work on building our love maps so we know one another's world, what's important to your spouse, what matters to them. We work on sharing fondness and admiration, which is really this idea that when I see my spouse or when I'm with them, I have fondness and admiration for them. So despite maybe the things they do that annoy me, like putting the toilet paper wrong or using the, using the uh, toothpaste incorrectly, that I really share fondness and admiration, that I can overlook those things or at least notice them and be aware of them and still have fondness and admiration. And there's things he does with each of these activities that help us build uh, each of these because we can all use strengthening on each of these like, principles or ideas. But then he talks about we turn towards each other rather than turning away. Um, and that's a really common thing in our marriage. When there's a problem, do we turn towards one another to solve it or come to a, a conclusion or even just to be together, even if we can't solve it? Or do we turn away and look externally or look to other things to take care of it, our depression, our sadness, whatever it might be? And then this idea that we have a positive perspective, kind of this unconditional positive regard for my spouse, um, that that exists. And then how we manage conflict, right? We, a lot of these skills you'll see that he talks about is practicing self-soothing, accepting your partner's influence. A lot of these really mindfulness will help you in every one of these areas. And then making life streams come true and then kind of the pinnacle is we create shared meaning together. And that's kind of this, what we call this sound relationship house or these stages that help us have a healthy marriage. So what I'm going to do is when you think about, again, this idea of a mindful marriage, that I'm going to be mindful and pay attention to those things I often haven't given attention to because they become routine. Um, I'm going to be willing for activities or things that I haven't been willing for um, that I know I probably need to be that are effective and helpful for my marriage. Um, as we attend to these things and then we look at this idea of uh, this Gottman house that mindfulness really is going to position us in a place that we can start to improve these, those work ethics, right? That personal happiness work ethic or personal happiness ethic, that work ethic, and then even that acceptance ethic or that idea of just the passage of time, um, it will help us in all of these areas. And so this is my family um, and you can see them. So what I want you to do is we're going to engage in a little bit of a mindfulness practice. I told you we'd practice a few together today and we will. Um, so there you can see my family, this picture just, uh, it, I mean, you can see the multiple pictures that were taken, but it kind of uh, captures their personality and who they are. Well, I don't, I don't know about any of you, but I hate taking pictures. Um, my wife has, I mean, I, I'm ashamed to say this. She has to beg me to take pictures. And uh, so when you think about my willfulness, I'm very willful when it comes to pictures. I'm like, ah, I don't want to get dressed up. I don't want to even, you know, even the way I smile, look at how painful that is sometimes. That was actually one of my better smiles. Usually it's way more painful, but, but I just have a hard time. I don't love taking pictures and I get kind of this awkward look on my face and you can tell it's pretty excruciating and it's very, you know, unnatural for me, but I do it right. And I still do it. I can, I can cultivate this idea of willingness better in my relationship when it comes to maybe taking pictures. That's what I'm going to work on just by presenting to you today. So um, you thought you were getting help. You're actually helping me by letting me talk about this. But the other, the other thing that I, I want us to do is this idea of mindfulness. There's certain kinds of mindfulness. The one that I want to engage with and practice with you today is what's called a loving kindness mindfulness. So when I look at this picture, I can think of, man, I really love my family. I love my wife. I'm so grateful for the relationship we have. We've been married um, 16 and a half years now, and it doesn't mean there haven't been bumps, but I'm so grateful that uh, I get to be in this relationship with her. And there are times that I found, and it surprised me when we first got married and even later on, like nobody angers me more than her. I, I get 
you know, I'm pretty emotionally regulated, but man, there are times where I feel emotions more intensely with her than I ever have, you know, positive and negative, but, or effective and not effective. But the reality is I have experienced that. It surprised me a little bit. And I think that's true for a lot of the people that are closest to us, right? That we go through that. So this exercise specifically, this mindfulness practice we're going to engage in is really helping to cultivate this idea of compassion, fondness, and admiration, and loving kindness. And so what I want you to do is picture you can get, if you have your spouse there with you, um, you're welcome to face each other for this moment. Um, If you don't have anybody with you, that's okay too. You can You can look at a picture like I'm doing and think of a picture like uh, I'm doing. You can also uh, think of an image, a color, a memory. Maybe you've got some memory, but I want you to think of a memory where um, you felt this loving kindness towards your spouse um, and towards that person. So if if you're with each other, face each other. And uh, while you're facing each other, what I and or looking at this image, picturing this picture. We talk about getting in a mindful position, which is typically hands up. We sit up straight, eyes open, eyes closed. It doesn't matter. It's your choice. Um, If your mind wanders during this practice, that's okay. Just bring it back. Again, it's practicing mindfulness. I don't expect you to just all of a sudden be mindful in this very moment, but practice this, practice the mindfulness. So what I want you to do is... uh, Look at this memory, this picture, think of your spouse, think of the person that if if you're not married right now or currently, think of somebody you're connected to or close with. And we're gonna practice uh, sending loving kindness towards this individual. And so if if your spouse is there with you, you can face each other. I want you to look in each other's eyes and just notice, and if you're not with somebody, just again, notice as you think of this person, of this memory, that, that whatever it is, I want you to notice um, notice what reactions you have, notice the feelings that you have, notice the thoughts that arise, and just sit with those for a minute and pay attention to them. Again, if your mind wanders, bring it back to this very moment. Bring it back to the person you're staring at and looking at each other's eyes with. Bring it back to uh, this image, this memory, but this individual And what I want you to do is practice sending loving kindness towards this person. So you can say it in your mind that I feel loving kindness towards you. You can simply just get in touch with that feeling and then practice sending loving kindness towards them. Again, it's this idea that you're having this fondness or this admiration for this individual. and practice sending that loving kindness as you look at them, as you think about them. Maybe you have some thoughts of other emotions coming where just bring it back to that loving kindness and practice bringing it back. Bring it back to this very moment that you're in. And again, if you're there with your spouse, you don't have to say anything. Just look at each other and practice sending that loving kindness. Excellent. Okay, well, you've done it. This is a couple's exercise and one way to enhance or increase this idea of fondness and admiration, this idea of loving kindness towards your spouse. Now, there's so many uh, resources and so many options in regards to mindfulness practice, and and I'll share many of these with you. Um, I just want to quickly go over the benefits of mindfulness. So John Kabat-Zinn, if you're familiar with him, he's one of the leading researchers in mindfulness. You know, back 20, 30 years ago, mindfulness was very much looked at as this taboo, this overly religious Eastern practice that we didn't really know a lot about. Well, in the last 20, 30 years, we've had an incredible amount of research and the body of research has only grown and proven benefits to mindfulness. Well, it's just this idea, if you practice mindfulness 10 minutes a day, 
you reap the benefits. John Kabat-Zinn was kind of one of the leading researchers on that to find, you want to know what did it really take? How long did you really have to practice? And it really is 10 minutes a day. You just did almost five minutes. So well done. If you do it again, you'll have five more and you'll be there. Um, but it really, it's just 10 minutes a day. So you can see here the, the benefits of mindfulness. That's and these, again, these are research literature founded. Well, there's, there's benefits in mindfulness for couples, too, in our relationships. And we found these to be really important and effective. So you can see the individual ones. We kind of just showed you those. But the benefits to couples are this idea that you have this enhanced relationship satisfaction. And that's proven time and time again that 10 minutes a day brings enhanced relationship satisfaction. It also brings, brings this feeling and improved autonomy. You think about, well, how does that benefit couples? Well, if we both have this improved sense of autonomy, that allows us to be in the relationship more when we are. Um, we have this improved sense of relatedness, increased closeness, uh, increased acceptance of one's partner. So I'm able to truly accept them for who they are and practice acceptance rather than often we're a little bit willful and change focused. If they would just do that, if they would just do that, this, then we think somehow that's going to solve it or take care of it or leads to less frustration. Well, often there's this idea that we need to accept one as they are. You know what? I may never get them to put that toilet roll back on, on the uh, toilet dispenser. Um, and I can still love them, right? Or I may, they may squeeze their toothpaste wrong. And I'm, I'm minimizing, there's much bigger issues that we face than that. But the reality is these are some of the things we deal with. This uh, lowered relationship distress is the other thing. We, that's fantastic. So when we have stress within a relationship, uh, mindfulness lowers that distress. It also increases our ability to respond to relationship stress and to be more present, to be more ability to problem solve and be... Uh, proactive in it rather than reactive to it. It improves uh, this our perception of the relationship before and after disagreements, which I think is really interesting. A lot of couples think, oh, we should never have conflict. Well, the reality is you're two different people. You're going to have conflict. And, and in fact, John Gottman found that, you know, something like 67% of all conflict are perpetual problems that are unsolvable and will never be solved. So when you think about that, this idea of improve my perception of conflict before or after and disagreements is really important because there are many things I'm just going to have to accept we probably won't solve together, but we can still love one another. And then this idea that we're more adaptive in our communication styles. So that's the other thing that I, I find helpful. Um, this is just a quick little clip. You can see this couple here. This is one way to practice mindfulness. I love the looks they give each other. <laughs> as they kind of peek over it. Anyways, there's lots of ways to do mindfulness. Some, sometimes it may just be simply sitting with one another or being present with one another. So uh, we're going to do one quick exercise, um, one more exercise. And, and there's a lot of apps. Many of you have probably used apps yourself. Uh, there, there are a lot of apps that you could use. I'm going to give you a quick uh, one from Headspace, if you've ever heard of Headspace, and I'll just have you practice this together really quick. This is one minute, so engage in this practice. You can sit like that couple is if you're together. Otherwise, you can sit just how we talked about, and uh, we'll let you engage in this practice. And again, there's so many resources, and I would encourage you to just practice and try them. So here we go. So perhaps you're fortunate enough to be sitting right next to that person you really care about right now. If not, if they're a little further away, just bringing that person to mind. And I'd like you to begin by taking a nice big deep breath, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. And as you breathe out through the mouth, just gently closing the eyes and allowing the breath to return to its natural rhythm. And I'd like you to imagine that every time the body breathes out, every time you exhale, you're just sharing a sense of happiness, of love, whatever you want to call it, with that other person. 
So just following each out breath. Sense of sharing happiness with that other person. Still aware of the in breath. Following the out breath. And when you imagine that person looking as happy as they possibly could, just gently opening the eyes again. So that's a quick practice, right? It doesn't have to be long. There's so many options. There's so many resources. I hope you'll uh, take advantage of them in what you're doing as you're kind of going through. That that really is the hope that you take advantage of the practice. You take advantage of the opportunities. Again, it's helping us balance that acceptance versus change in our relationship, helping us be willing. Let me just show you um, real quick, these are some of the mindfulness apps that are available and you can use them. You can get on YouTube. You can find things there. A lot of them have things geared towards couples and relationships. Um, but these are some of the common ones that are used. Um, Headspace, you just kind of experienced a quick sample of that one. But, uh, you know, sometimes people really like to have something just to help them get going. And then they engage in this. And it doesn't, you know, again, it can be quick doesn't have to be long, but hopefully it's something that's practical and, and uh, helpful for you. And I've got lots of other ideas. We'll, we can kind of go through those as we get into the question and answer. I'll flip through these as we're talking. Um, but my hope is, again, those things that have become routine, those things that have become just like driving home within your marriage, that this gives you an opportunity to step back make a conscious choice. It is a choice. I'm going to be willing. I'm going to make a conscious choice to engage with some of those specific work ethics or those ethics that were talked about, that personal happiness, that work ethic, um, that holding out ethic, whatever that is. I'm going to engage in those. I'm going to be willing. And then I'm going to practice being present with my spouse, my relationship that matters, the one that I need to attend to the most. And I'm going to make sure that I make time to do so as I work to increase those factors that we know will bring happiness uh, and satisfaction and effectiveness to your relationship as you move forward. So love to answer questions. I want to be sure that we have time for that. Um, and so please put those in the chat and the question and answer. And uh, I'll, I'll attend to those as we go through. And if you have any, just again, use that question and answer box so that I'm sure to attend to those questions. So um, I just want to make a note that um, if you want your question to be anonymous, there's a, an option to indicate that. So, oh, perfect. Thanks, Camille. Yeah, use that feature if you want to have an anonymous question. That's perfect. Excellent. While you're asking those questions, and I'll attend to those and watch for them, the question and answer, let me just show you just some quick ideas of things you can do to be more mindful in your marriage. Um, these are, you know, one is just disconnect. I, I don't know about you, but uh, there's a great feature on your iPhone. It's called screen time. Um, and if you get on there, you go to settings, go to screen time. It'll actually tell you how much time you're spending on your phone, where you're spending it. And then if you actually go down, you'll see that it tells you how many times you even pick up your phone during the day. That's a great way to even monitor and just look at, okay, am I really disconnecting? Am I really making time when I get home from work or whatever that is to be present with the people around me, especially to be present in my marriage? Um, so that's a great one. You know, active listening, being there, listening to my partner, asking questions. Be, again, being this curious observer, being willing to hear what they need to say what they say rather than assuming I know what they're going to say, which can happen because that can feel routine at times. Uh, being grateful. Notice the times when your partner um, makes you feel happy and feel gratitude for those moments and even express that to them. Sometimes it's just being silent together, being able to just sit with that individual and be present with them, right? See through, seeing things through new eyes, uh, you, will, you will be amazed as you're more mindful in your marriage how you start to see them 
those that are around you, but specifically your spouse, you'll see them through new eyes. You'll see them in ways you haven't seen them. You'll realize things that maybe you've overlooked or not been aware of that you can attend to now at this point. Um, this was a great question. Uh, how would you recommend inviting your spouse to do some mindfulness exercises together if they are in the willful, not willing space? That's a fantastic question. And I, a great word usage too. the things we were talking about. Um, what I would first recommend is that you work on your own willingness. So uh, my, this is the hardest part. Sometimes we can, we, you saw, right? The impact that it has on couples is really important. Well, as you noticed, a lot of these exercises you don't have to do with another person. In fact, even the one we were just doing, that loving kindness, right? Remember the loving kindness, picturing an image, picturing that person. Those are ways that I can engage in that. Focused on the relationship, focused on my spouse, even if they're choosing not to engage in that kind of a practice with me. Because what that does and what that increases for me is if I see my spouse in a willful space, Base, it's easy to get stuck on that and think, man, if they would just do this, or if they just do that, it actually leads to my own unhappiness, right? And so the thing that I do to engage them is I work on my own willingness. I invite them to activities. I also work on those loving kindness practices or those, meta, you know, again, those mindfulness practices. We saw the benefits to couples. Well, the nice thing is even if the other person doesn't engage, you still start to reap the benefit. And over time, you'll see that your, your spouse may start to engage with you. They may not. However, you'll still reap the benefits of mindfulness in that 10 minute practice each day. So great question. I'm happy to attend to others as well. Yeah, this is a great one. My husband's depressive and he has panic attacks. Uh, I try, I try to understand, but sometimes I don't have the patience. How could uh, stopping to, uh, sorry, how could stop to feel, feel guilty for those moments that I exploit? Um, I think this is a great, yeah, great question is he may be depressive at times. He may have panic attacks. It's difficult to understand. You may not have patience, right? And again, I think, you know, this is the answer. Being more mindful will actually help you in those moments. Because what it allows me to do is maybe have the other thing that we know from mindfulness, one of the other benefits is you actually have increased empathy for the very things you don't understand. So if I'm able to practice mindfulness, I'm able to look at my husband through new eyes and realize, hey, some of those panic attacks actually may get in the way of some of the activities I want to do with him. Uh, his depression may very much, uh, he may not want to go do some of those activities. However, what it might do, if I'm a very doing mind person, it may help me actually to be more in being mind, which might just be, you know, honey, I know today's a tough night. I'm going to just be with you and be present with you. We don't have to say anything. Just know I'm here and I'm with you, right? And taking moments to do that, um, again, can help us be more mindful, but be present and reap those benefits that we just talked about, that greater empathy, that greater sense of fondness and admiration for that individual and, and what they're going through or experiencing. And it, of course, there's a practical side. It doesn't mean you don't encourage them to get help and all those other things, but Often when a loved one's struggling, I loved that, that ethic of just getting through it. Sometimes what's unbearable in this moment, if I can practice mindfulness to help me bear it and accept this very moment for what it is, even though it's difficult and it's painful and they're suffering, it's not something I ever pictured, um, I actually will be able to, to use that idea of that ethic of just being able to get through it and allow that passage of time. So great, great question. Um, this was another one. Another question was, what advice do you have for individuals in the first year of marriage known for conflict and finding differences? Isn't that so true? Um, that It's amazing how I, I remember in that first year, and as I've counseled couples and worked with couples for many, many years, that first year can be really, really hard. It's blissful on the one hand. And on the other hand, there's intense emotion. There's intense conflict. There's intense surprises that you maybe didn't know about that individual that you start to discover. Right. And then this second part to the question was also with a spouse with mental health concerns. When do you recommend seeking counseling? So trying to manage alone, 
uh, uh, mindfulness, et cetera. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting because you look at when there's mental health concerns, I would recommend at least seeking counseling. Now, the, the hard part is you can invite your spouse to come with you, but it's an invitation and they may or may not join you. And so what you're doing is I'm going and it may be simply just applying that personal work ethic, right? That I'm going to work on my own personal happiness, my own mindfulness. As I do that, what I'm also working on is my ability to see that individual, to see their struggle and realize this may be something over time that will pass. And it may not, but regardless, I'm going to do the work I need to do, and I'm going to invite them to join me along the way. And so I think that's a really, really critical part. But I think don't be afraid of the differences. They're, you're different on, on purpose. You actually like each other because you're different. That's what attracted you to each other. Often we're very attracted to those that are very opposite from us. You know, as we looked at that being mind uh, and that emotional mind versus that doing mind and logical mind, often we're attracted to those that truly are swing the opposite of what we do. And so knowing that, knowing those differences are actually, I can be mindful and be present and see the differences, yet still understand that I have this fondness and loving kindness towards them, even if I don't like the differences in this very moment, right? And so I think allowing that to occur, allowing myself to maybe have some more acceptance versus very change focus, sometimes in that early stages of marriage, we discover things we didn't realize and our tendencies, we're going to change it, change it, change it. And maybe I need to be a little more acceptance focused and my own willingness to accept this very moment for what it is, which then my acceptance of the moment and what they're struggling with then allows me to do something different with it. And mindfulness can be a great way to help us start to do that. So hopefully that's helpful. This is a great question. How can mindfulness help get us out of the silent treatment process? Yeah, so John Gottman refers to that behavior specifically, that silent treatment, what we may call that as stonewalling. Um, and, and stonewalling can, I mean, he talks about, again, this is one of those toxic behaviors, right? And many of us have engaged in it. And so it's this idea of what, what, what could I do or how could I use mindfulness to help me when maybe we're stonewalling, maybe it's you stonewalling your spouse, maybe it's your spouse stonewalling you. Um, and I, I think, again, it will help us because if I'm a little more empathetic towards them and a little more to this point of, hey, I don't need to be so reactive to the emotion that I feel in this very moment by going silent, by, by not engaging with them. I think those two things in and of themselves allow us to be a little more willing to come to the table and work. And then if my spouse is, is very much stonewalling me, I just let them know, hey, honey, I can't imagine what you must be going through the emotion you must be feeling, right? Because I'm mindful of that. And then also inviting them when you're ready, I'd love to talk because I want to figure this out. And I want you to know that you're important to me. And then during that time, while they're in the stonewalling and you're not or not wanting to be, I would engage in practicing, right, some of that loving kindness, mindfulness, and sending that loving kindness towards them in my own heart, my own mind, which increases empathy, increases my ability to be less reactive over time to that very behavior that may be disruptive in that moment. So hopefully that's helpful. So these, yeah, these have been fantastic questions. Um, as we, as we kind of look, we went through a couple ideas. Let me just show you one or two more if there's not any other questions. You can see the eye gazing is one we practiced, we embrace, we breathe together, we have a mindful conversation. Those are all things that we can do. We can be compassionate. We can meditate together. That's that loving kindness meditation. We can do mindful touching. Uh, we can think before speaking, sometimes just remembering that. Um, we choose to respond how we're going to respond. We create vision and shared meaning with one another through mindfulness. We engage in caring behaviors and, and those things that we do. And then this idea that I have daily appreciation for the individual that's there in my life. So rather than letting it be routine, I'm going to every day let them know um, how grateful I am for them and something I appreciate or love about them. And then I'm going to allow time for myself to think about those. And, and again, engaging in this practice of the mindful marriage, uh, it we will reap the benefits and the benefits you saw are fantastic. And uh, anyways, 
in the end, as we saw over time, as we engage in those, that will lead to a, a much more satisfying marriage and much more satisfying relationship. So great questions. Thank you, everybody, for letting me be here with you and be on with you. Um, I know Camilla's got maybe one thing she's going to remind us to do. So <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Simpson, for this wonderful presentation. It was very, very calming. <laughs> You did a you did a fantastic job, and I know um, all of our participants um, enjoy and really enjoyed the Q and A session. Those were some awesome questions. Um, so this webinar is recorded, and it will the recording will be available on our website a week from today. Um, you can just visit strongermarriage.org and go to the webinar calendar, and there'll be a link to see all of our archived webinars from the the. From previous webinars as well um, and it would be so great uh, when you log off a survey will come up immediately once you immediately after this and if you could fill that out and give us feedback we'd love to hear how you enjoyed this webinar and what we could be doing better um, any feedback really helps so thank you so much everybody um, and thank you so much again dr simpson um, i hope you all have a great evening <laughs> Thanks for letting me be with you. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.